Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh man, God is good. Alrighty. So Shannon, any updates? What, what was that like? Did you speak in tongues? Praise the Lord. Come on, give Jesus a big shout of praise. Hallelujah. A couple of weeks ago, your husband was up here after service. In fact, I would say 90% of the people had gone and he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. And um, I, I'm, I'm so thankful to God that my wife did mention that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were together. Not only were they together in one place, the Bible says they were also in one accord. And there is nothing that makes us united, that brings us into one accord, like the power of the Holy Spirit, nothing else. And so now you will see 10,000 put to flight when you stand together in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. God is good. We will go very quickly to Jeremiah chapter 17, verse uh, chapter 19 actually, verse 21. We're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 19. And um, I want to say welcome uh, to my brother Ron. And my sister Nicole, good to see you. And also, Lindsay, good to see you also. It's been a minute, good to see you. You know some people, even if you haven't seen them for 10 years, they look like they looked when you saw them the last time. Yeah. So whatever soap you're using, you may want to recommend it to the rest of us. Oh yeah, whatever that routine is, we need to get in on it. Praise the Lord. Because the Bible did say that the outward man perishes, but the inward man is renewed day by day. And so, I don't know if your outward man is renewed day by day. You may know something that we don't. Praise God. So, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 21. 19 is not what it is, but it is 17, 21. The Bible says, thus says the Lord. In fact, I want to show us two things very quickly before we read verse 21. If you would come with me to verse 13. Actually, let's read from verse 12 to 14 very quickly. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place <clears throat> of our sanctuary. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me, now this is God speaking, shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord the fountain of living waters the Lord says the ones who forsake me they will be written into the earth because you have the choice of choosing the one who is life and if you don't choose him there is no life outside of him and one of the things that I want to bring out very quickly is we need to understand the nature of God and the nature of our relationship with God. Because many a times we are so consumed by the things that we are missing that we forget that it is not what Things you are missing that should be paramount on your heart, but the one who is missing you. Because when we do not spend time with the one who is the fountain of life, who is the source of joy, we cannot find that life or that joy anywhere else. But the irony of it is this. Many of us are so preoccupied by the lack of joy, by the lack of peace, that we say that is the reason why we are not seeking God as we should. We tell God, God, I want to pray some more, but I would love to pray when I'm not so bothered about all these troubles that I'm going through. When I come to the sanctuary and people are singing and dancing, I want to be able to do that. But not with the kind of day that I'm having. God, if you want some prayers, you better give me a better day. People are asking God to take the shackles off their feet so that they can praise him. Whereas, while praising him, no shackles can hold. The Lord says, I'm not the one who put them in the ground. I was the one who reached out to them. But because they shunned my advances, 
they had nowhere else to go but the ground. Why? Because the Lord is the most high. You read it just now. The Bible says a very high throne from the beginning is our sanctuary. When we seek God and we lose ourselves in the presence of God, we become higher than the situations that oppress men and the confusions that deter many. You need to recognize where you belong and with whom you belong. We should never allow anything to keep us away from seeking God, from pursuing him with all of our hearts, simply because everything that we seek is in his presence. The Bible says in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy and at his right hand, pleasures forevermore. We're going to skip 14. Let's just go to 21. The Bible says, thus saith the Lord, take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day. Now bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. Praise God. Let's read that again. The Lord says, be careful. Do not let any burdens keep you from resting in me. The Shabbat is the Lord's rest. And when Jesus came, he says, come unto me, all of you who are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You need to rebuke yourself. You need to tell yourself that no burdens will go with you into his presence. He says, do not bring them into the gates of Jerusalem. Many of us, we have come to have a, 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 a dislike, so to speak, for the presence of God. Because of what you have made it. Many of us are no longer glad when they say to us, let us go into the house of the Lord, simply because you have come to associate the house of the Lord with that place that you take your burdens to. And the Lord says, you will enter my gates, not with burdens, but with praise. It is time for us to take heed. You see, if you do not rebuke yourself, sometimes no one else will. We need to start. My wife has an expression that she uses all the time. I didn't like it at the beginning, but now I love it. She used to say, you yourself tell yourself the truth. She's never heard me say it. You heard what she said. She was like, so you know it. Because I used to just shut off whenever she says it. But then after a while, I realized that sometimes others don't even know the truth about what it is like I do. A lot of what you're going through, if you would tell yourself the truth, then you would know when you're sleeping too much. I might not know in my house, but you know. When you're worrying too much, Chris may not know, but you know. And that is the reason why the Lord came here and he said to them, even you, beware, be mindful. If you're doing it and nobody sees you, you've been bringing yourself worry. You've been worrying and carrying burdens on the Sabbath. No one saw you, but the Lord says, I see you and you see yourself. The Lord is saying, be mindful. He says, take heed to yourself and bear no burden on the Sabbath. I want to encourage us to recognize the times that we are in. We have come to a dispensation that is not short of troubles, that is not lacking in challenges. Many at times, for many of us, if we are going to tell ourselves the truth, we know that we have been through tough times in recent times and many people around us have experienced the same. Lately, quite up, lately, almost anybody who comes up, several people rather have come up to me lately to say, I'm going through this, I'm going through that. I'm like, oh my goodness, me too. Oh yeah, because the Bible says there is no temptation that is not common to all. There's no need to be feeling special about your trouble. That's what the Bible says. What makes us special is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that called us a royal priesthood and a peculiar people. But when it comes to troubles, they are a dime a dozen. 
But what do we mean by coming to a dispensation of many troubles? We have come to a dispensation of power. That's what it means because God will not allow for you to come under a burden that you cannot bear. He says in his word, I will not give you more than you can handle. And so if you find yourself being opposed, if you find yourself being troubled to the point wherein you're no longer able to access the joy of his presence, you're playing into the hands of the enemy. Because that's what the devil wants. He wants you to focus so much on that which is on the ground that you forget that your sanctuary is that high throne. And let me tell you something. The Bible says that throne has been a high throne from the beginning. And because there is a beginning, that means there is an end. And if that throne has been a sanctuary from the beginning, and when the end comes, the Bible says that we shall be the pillars around that throne, then what is all of these things that I am going through that I, that, that, that should what are these things that I am going through compared to where I am going to? What are these things? How come I allow for them to weigh me down when they are but for a moment? The Bible says that our light afflictions are but for a moment, but they are working out for us a far exceeding and eternal weight of glory. When you think about where you're coming from, from the beginning means the beginning. Not the beginning of your life. Not the beginning of your trials. Not the beginning of your marriage. Not the beginning of your children behaving badly. Not the beginning of your financial challenges. The Bible says from the beginning, there has been a sanctuary even before you became a thought in the mind of the Almighty God. There already was a sanctuary. I say that today to let you know that regardless of what trauma you have been through in your life, either as a child, as a teenager, or as an adult, it doesn't precede your privilege. Your privilege in Christ Jesus is eternal. And all of these trials come so that you can see yourself for who you are in him. Because if we are not tested, then how do we come to have an experience of who we are? We can have a knowledge of who we are because somebody said so. But that is just a head knowledge. Do you know how many of us have read in scriptures wherein it says that we are loved and highly favored? And yet, every time you're going for a job interview, your heart beats faster than a ceiling fan. You are loved and highly favored. If the favor of God is upon you and you know it, then there's no need for you to panic. And that is the reason why God allows you to go through situations that you can only make it out of if the favor of God speaks for you. And so if the favor of God has spoken for you in that situation and in that situation, then it becomes a part of you, not just as a head knowledge, but it becomes a part of you as a consciousness within your soul. The object of our Christian walk is for us to come to know that we have been truly made in his image and in his likeness. Now, somebody may think that is a trivialization of the Christian journey, but I will prove it to you. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, God said, let us now make man in our image and after our likeness and let him have dominion over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, over every cattle and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. That was the intention of God, to make man in his image and in his likeness. But the man did not know it by having that internal consciousness of who he was. And that was the reason why when the serpent came and said, if you eat of this fruit, you will be like God. Because if he already knew who he was, he would have said, I don't get it. I'm already like God. Are you selling something else today? If not, keep moving. You understand what I mean? But because he hadn't experienced it, he had, to, he had to go through it to then know that he was already a son of God. 
And to be a son of God means to be like your father because you do not find the son of a dog that looks like a cat. He might be of the same size while still growing up, but he's still a dog. And I tell you what, Adam had not experienced that. I think one of his biggest problems was that he did not grow up. He was just made a man. He woke up from the dust of the earth and he needed to shave. If he had gone through the motion of counting hair strands in front of the mirror so you can tell your friends, now my beard are full. If you've gone through Spending time in the mirror popping at me pimples. You will appreciate what it means to have a smooth face in your latter years. But I, Adam did not go through all of that. He woke up and he was just a man. So everything that God had for him, he just heard that it was said, but he hadn't come to experience it himself. And God was like, there is no way. There is no other way. They have to go through the storm. They have to go through it. For them to know the quality of the voice that I have put inside of them. The Lord said, to whom shall we reveal knowledge? Who shall we teach understanding? It has to be the ones that have been weaned from the breast. We need to take them from when they were, from when they're children. They have to begin this journey as infants. And they have to go one line upon a line, one precept upon a precept. And one step upon a step. Because if you do not go through all of that, you will not rise in the ranks. Because Adam was given the privilege and he blew it because there is no sustaining power in having knowledge that is just in your brain. You need to have a consciousness within you. And that is the reason why we'll go through tests and trials. That is the reason why we'll go through these many challenges because God wants to reveal to you what he has already put on the inside of you. Now, if that is the reason and we understand it, then should we not have a better understanding of what Paul was saying when he says rejoice in tribulations. He says, look at me. He says, I have come to rejoice even when I have nothing. He says, I have come to live my life with and without. I know how to live with and I know how to live without. Let me tell you something. The Bible says in God, all things consist. Everything is in your heavenly father. And so if you are made in his image and in his likeness, does that not mean that you also have all things? So at what point should not having money or not having a job or not having this or that then stop you from being the joyful soul that your heavenly father made you to be? Does that, doesn't that mean that you have now agreed with Satan that you're no longer like your heavenly father because now you're lacking something? Because if you are like your heavenly father, you do not lack anything good. Let me say that again in another way. You see, a lot of what the devil uses to get our attention to get us screaming for help when we should be shouting his praise, the praise of our heavenly father. A lot of what the devil uses to get us are exactly the things that we have already overcome in Christ Jesus. They are exactly the things that have already been given to us by virtue of being sons in the kingdom of the Lord of all spirits. But the devil will come and he will dangle it in front of you. He will wave it at you and tell you, you need to rock, come and get it. But the Bible says there is nothing any man has that he has not received from above. Every good gift, the Bible says, and every perfect gift comes from the Father of light with whom there is no variableness. So if he says that my children are like me, he doesn't have exceptions. He doesn't say, well, all my children are like me. They have all things and they are bound, except, of course, for Manda Lida when she hasn't prayed for five hours. We allow ourselves to come under those burdens that the Lord has redeemed us from. We need to start to operate, like I said on Tuesday, not for righteousness, but from righteousness. You know what Paul said to the Philippians when he was blessing them? He said, I have seen your generosity and I can guarantee you one thing. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory 
in Christ Jesus. And I tell you what, many of us still don't know what that means. Because we say that we have confessed it and professed it and sometimes we still have needs that are not met. I want you to look at it from a different perspective today. He says, my God shall supply your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And the Bible says Christ Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily because in him all things consist both in heaven and on the earth. And so if everything consists in him, and Paul is telling them that God will supply all their needs according to that riches in glory by Christ Jesus. All he was asking them to do is to not just focus on their good works, but to also focus on the good Lord. Because if you are in that Christ Jesus, everything you need is already in there. But here we are, we allow the illusion of lack to draw us out of Christ. You are already seated in him at the right hand of the Father where you have all things. So whatever it is that you seem to be missing on the outside is only calling out to you to see whether you know if you are missing anything or not. Now let me, I say that very slowly because I don't want you to miss, understand, because there are times when we do go through what appears to be pressing needs. And like, I don't know what this one is talking about. Because there are times when the need is real. You understand what I mean? Yeah, I've been homeless before. I've slept in an office before just because I didn't have anywhere else to go. So I know sometimes the need can be real, but I want you to look at it from the perspective of the fact that, wait a minute, if I already have all things and it appears as though I do not have something, then that means that thing which I do not have is nothing. Come with me to John chapter 1. We need to teach the gospel of nothing. There is, a, there is a principle here in John chapter 1 that lets you know that you can reduce that which is lacking to nothing. John chapter 1, we can recite it by heart, but today we need to read it. The Bible says in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Did we not just read that we have a throne from the beginning that is our sanctuary? And the Bible says all things were made by him or all things were made through him and without him was nothing made that was made. The Bible says without, without him nothing was made. That was made. Huh. I pray that you get it. Nothing can be made. <laughs> Don't worry. It sounds simple. But the reality of it is once you get it. You see, nothing was made. The Bible says without him, without him nothing was made. That was made. The way I understand it by the Holy Spirit is how I'm sharing it with you. So now relate that to what I was saying about what is lacking in your life. That which is lacking in your life, that money that you do not have, that housing that you do not have, that opportunity that others have received that you do not have, is bothering you because it is still something to you. It is because it is still something to you. But the moment you recognize that, oh, it's only an illusion, it's nothing, it ceases to be because you can make it nothing. As long as it is something and you don't have it, it's going to bother you. But if you realize that you already have all things, anything that appears to be missing in your life is nothing. 
You have to tell that thing it is nothing. Let me give you a very practical example. I've said this with, with some of y'all before. When I was little, I would have, uh, what do they call that stuff wherein you sleep and then you wake up and you sleep paralysis. And it usually happens after a bad dream. Maybe your neighbor's dog was chasing you in the dream or something ridiculous like that or that aunt that you know practices witchcraft decides to show up in your dream. And when the aunt showed up in your dream, you forgot all the scriptures that you knew and you couldn't shout Jesus. You know how it is in those dreams wherein you want to shout Jesus and your mouth cannot move. And you immediately conclude within yourself that you're doomed because you could not shout Jesus. You know how terrified we get when we have sleep paralysis like that? Has anyone ever had it the way that I'm describing it? Wherein you're so terrified in the dream, you want to shout Jesus, you cannot shout Jesus. And, you're, and then you wake up and you can see the walls of your room and that fake nightstand, but you cannot move your hand. And then you feel even more terrified because now you cannot move. That would happen to me a lot. And one day I was preparing to go minister at a church. And back in the day, I think I was maybe, I don't know, 14 or so. So my mom always insisted that my brother prepares my sermon notes with me so that I, someone looks over what I'm about to go say. And the one who was supposed to look over my sermon note fell asleep. And I was, I was there just continuing to prepare my note. And after a while, I fell asleep too. But the year before, they had invited me to speak at that church. And while I was speaking at the church, because I went in there fasting. I had been fasting for like two or three days. No water. My throat was parched and I was going to preach. You know, sometimes it's not enough to just have the zeal. You have to have the understanding. I was so zealous, I went there fasting and the moment they gave me the microphone, I had barely quoted two or three scriptures when I lost my voice and I started coughing profusely. They had to go to the next building to get water because back in the day, people didn't bring water to church and coffee, you know, when people were still believers. I'm sorry, when people were still Christians. Now, you know, now we're spoiled. We're, they, we're in the dispensation of grace. You know, back in the day, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You come to church and there is no water because everybody just brings their big Bibles and... And the tambourine, there's no room for travel mugs and, and flasks and smoothies and all that good stuff. And so they had to go to the next building. I was coughing my, my eyes out. And so we said the following, the next time they invited me, I was like, okay, I'm not going there fasting. I'm going to fast before the day. So I had fasted for like three days before going to minister. When we still thought you, the Holy Spirit can only move as much as you fast. We used to think like that. We used to think that if you were not fasted and prayed up, how would the Holy Spirit even use you when you are all flesh? So we would fast and we would pray. Well, I mean, it worked for us, but I'm just saying that a lot of what we were doing limited us in more ways than it aided us because when the Holy Spirit was ready to move, you restricted yourself because you felt like you didn't do enough. Anyway, story for another day. So I was already fasted and prayed up while I was preparing that sermon. The morning before I went to minister, I also fell asleep next to my mentor. <laughs> Be careful who is discipling you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because kind begets kind. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. But Christ did not fall asleep like that, so I should not have followed him, but I did. I fell asleep too. And then in the dream, I saw a lion. A lion appeared in the dream and I was so afraid. Let me tell you something real about having conflict with people. The Bible says, be at peace with all men. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see God. The lion appeared to me at the junction to the house of one of the boys at school that was at war with me. And so the, mom the moment I saw the lion, immediately I concluded that it must be because of the conflict. That this lion must be an, op an, an opposition. And so I was so afraid. And then I woke up into a sleep paralysis. I couldn't move. I couldn't even shout Jesus. But one thing hit me in that very moment. I thought to myself in that moment. If ever I am going to be powerful enough and strong enough. To be confident in God in a situation like this. It has to be this morning. Because I've been fasting and praying. So if anything is appearing to me, I should be able to shake it off. And you know what I did? 
I just continued sleeping. And when I woke up, the Lord said to me, you did the right thing because I have given you peace. He says, the lion that you saw, can you remember what it looked like? And that was all he needed to say when I realized that the lion that I saw was the lion of Judah himself. I was supposed to be at peace, but I panicked because of my carnal knowledge. It kept me from embracing and receiving the gift that God brought to me in the dream. And that was the last time all through my growing up years that I forced myself to wake up from sleep paralysis. Anytime it happened to me, I would just fall asleep because the Holy Spirit broke it down to me. He said to me, what happens to people when they have sleep paralysis, in case you have not heard me say this before, you may want to take note, is because when you see things that are unpleasant or that agitate you in your dream and you wake up, your body is still asleep, but your consciousness is now engaged. So your eyes pop open because it is the window to your conscious processing. So your eyes open, but your re the rest of your body is still asleep. It is not a demon that is sitting on you. It is just that your body is not yet awake. Your mouth is not awake. That is the reason why you can't shout Jesus. Be confident enough in God to know that you dwell in his secret place and abide under his shadow. Be confident enough to know that you live and move and have your being on the inside of God. And if that is truly the case, how can a demon come into God to sit on you? Roll over and sleep. I am not teaching you laxity. I am encouraging you to be confident. Because some people say, oh, when I have a bad dream, I should pray. Yes, that's because you're afraid. And when you pray out of fear, it is only for your own entertainment. Because God, the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. The only prayers that God is listening to are not the prayers of panic, but the prayers of faith. The Bible says the prayer of faith shall heal the sick. The disciples were crying to Jesus. He was not even in heaven. He was on the same boat as they were, and their situation did not improve. If anything at all, their boat started to fill with water, simply because they were crying out to him out of fear. And when Jesus woke up, he was like, Oh, you of little faith. Whenever they spoke out of fear, what did he call them? He called them a wicked and a perverse generation. Simply because a prayer of faith is the sacrifice of, a prayer of fear is the sacrifice of the wicked. And the Bible says it is an abomination to God. Many people have prayed and fasted for years about a situation and put the blame on God for not having answered. When in reality, heaven is not even aware that you're praying because they don't hear such prayers. Fear takes a hold. You know that the Bible says Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Satan uses religion to hold more people down in this world than he uses any other kind of spell. Religion is one of the strongest strongholds. It's one of the biggest strongholds that Satan uses to keep people down because it makes them feel like they need to pray a certain way. And a lot of those prayers are not inspired by confidence in God, but rather they are inspired by the weight of the burden or by the panic that it brings. God says, be mindful that you're not coming into my rest with a burden. When you're coming to Zion, don't come here worrying. There's no room. You can only come in through praise and thanksgiving. So we need to know how to reduce the monumental troubles that are presented to us by the world, by situations, by life and Satan. We need to learn how to reduce those things to nothing so that they do not get in the way of you being able to give praise to your God. If someone is threatening you that they will take your car from you, that they will take your house from you, remind yourself that those things are nothing. Because if they continue to appear to be big deals to you, there will be hindrances to you getting into Christ. And in that Christ is everything. So you should always run the race of pressing in to get into Christ. Let nothing 
bear so much on your mind that you are not able to pray. Do you know that there are times when we want to pray and all we can do is just like, oh, you just give a sigh of relief. David says, whenever I do that, it weakens my bones. He says, in silence, my bones grew weak within me. And then he woke up spiritually and he said, I believe, therefore I speak. Many of us are not praying, we're sighing. Many of us are not interceding, we're weeping. But the reality of it is, none of those emotions are capable of achieving anything without faith being present. When you have faith in God and you're confident enough in God, to then have an emotional expression to support your faith, yes, that is welcome. Remember the man who came to Jesus with his son being demon possessed? He says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And the Bible says a tear ran down his cheek. That was not an expression of unbelief. That was an emotional expression of joy and confidence in God because as soon as he shed that tear, Jesus says, let it be unto you according to your faith. Not according to your fear. Not according to your assessment of your situation. If nothing was made by the word, you have the same word of God to reduce the situations that trouble you to nothing. You need to tell the infirmity in your body that it is nothing. You need to tell the symptoms in your body that it is nothing. You need by faith to reduce those things to nothing. And let me tell you something, they might not disappear overnight, but you need to learn the process of eliminating them out of your life. Don't expect for them to just disappear so that you can go back to binging on Netflix. Let your demonstration of the confidence you have in the word of God that is able to reduce mountains to nothing be demonstrated by your praise. If that thing is truly nothing, let me see you in God's presence praising God. Because faith without works is dead. And so I need to put some words to my faith. If I truly believe that the challenges that I am facing are nothing, then when you see me, you should not see the problem. But you see some people, when you see them, the first thing you see is their situation. Every time you see them, it is their problem. Let me tell you something. If people see you and they see problems all the time, how are you able to then avoid demons who are looking for people to torment even some more? Because when demons see you and you're always having trouble, they call other demons like, that one is easy. <laughs> they're already under a burden so we just need to add a little to the problem and we can paralyze them completely when people see you let them see the demonstration of the confidence that you have in God that that issue is nothing because when you reduce that thing to nothing then the glory of the lamb can be seen shining forth on you the radiance, the peace and the joy you know there are times when I have come in here one day Alan called me on the phone and I couldn't speak because I was, I was in my, my body was aching. Seriously aching from the allergy that I was suffering. And I, I, I was like, you know, I'm going to have to call you back. And he was like, everything okay? I said, oh, I've been dealing with this thing for days. He said, but you preached last night. I said, yeah, I did. He said, but you said for days. I said, for days. I said, I preached last night because I had to tell myself that this thing has come as an opposition. And the Bible says, who are you? Mountain before Zerubbabel. Be made nothing. The Bible says, be made a plain. So I told him, I said, when it was time for service, my wife was checking on me. She was checking on me religiously because she already knew my answer would be, I was going. So she was like, are you coming? I said, of course, you know I am coming. And I kept telling myself, I am going to do the work of him who has sent me. While it is day for the night comes when no man can walk. I got into that shower. I showered and I was still shaking a little bit. But I kept going. There are instances where you have to tell that thing it is nothing. I could have made that my excuse for not showing up. I could have made that my excuse for not praising God. But I came in here and I praised God as though I had just won the lottery. I praise God as though everything was all right because the reality of it is that everything is all right. Who am I agreeing with? My situation or oh my God? And after he got off the phone, 
I shook off the beast and I started feeling well. And I was like, what was that about? And the Holy Spirit said to me, he said it was for his learning that he needed to know that sometimes the man of God is going through the storm, but he still sleeps and rests in God. After I spoke to you, I started feeling better. And the Holy Spirit said to me, he allowed for you to notice something was wrong with me for you to ask so that I can testify of the resolve that is within me to make sure that nothing stops me from pressing into Christ. The devil is a storyteller. He will tell you stories. He fulfills the opposite of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says Jesus speaking that the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance all of the things that I have said, that he may teach you, that he may comfort you. But the enemy brings to your remembrance all the evil that has happened in your past, that he may torment you and keep you down. Don't let him remind you of things that are already behind you, if those things are capable of stopping you, how did you get here? Going by what those people intended for you, you should have been buried since they came against you, but the Lord allowed for you to survive their tirades. The Lord allowed for you to survive the evil that they harbored within them. The Lord allowed for you to survive the difficulty, but now the enemy is making you feel like, ah, you were just lucky. In fact, it's not yet over. The panic, the trauma is still there. No, 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 no. The trauma might be there, but I am not. The Lord said to Jeremiah, Remember a couple of weeks ago I told you Jeremiah's problem was because he was so conscious of his limitations. He says, God, I, I like what you're saying, but I cannot answer your call. He said, because I am but a youth. And the Lord rebuked him immediately and said to him, you are not a youth. Stop thinking yourself. Stop thinking of yourself as unable. The Lord said to him, Jeremiah, you are not a youth. Repeat after me. I am not a youth. Shake that off. Stop thinking of limitations. Think about the fact that I said, even before you were formed in the belly, I knew you while you were yet in your mother's womb. I called you and ordained you a prophet unto the nations. That is all you need, not experience. That is all you need, not age. That is all you need, not gray hair. You need my word. You have my word. Knock yourself out. And that is what we need to remember. We need to remember that what we need is not when there are no troubles. What we need is when we come to realize that even if it appears to be an obstacle or an obstruction, I already have the word of God that makes nothing out of that which should not be. If that mountain is not supposed to be there, I use the word of God to remove it and reduce it to nothing. People were already operating this principle in the Old Testament. That was why Zerubbabel was like, who are you, mountain? I declare you nothing. Be made a plain. So I want to encourage you today. Let's read one more verse of scripture. Let's go to Mark chapter 4, verse 17. Mark chapter 4, verse 17. We might have read that recently, but... Maybe not here, but if it is, let's just read it again. Now, this was Jesus speaking. In Mark 4, 17, Jesus says, And they have no root in themselves, and so they endure only for a time. They have no root in themselves. Every situation that you're faced with, every obstacle that comes your way has no root in itself. The only reason why things linger is because we keep feeding them. The reason why fear keeps lingering is because we keep providing the support that it needs, but the Bible says it has no root in itself. Let me tell you something, a lot of us, we deal with the fear of the unknown. We try to live many days into the future. And every one of those concerns have no root in themselves. The only reason why you wake up with the same thought that you went to bed with was because of how much water you put in it. 
If you don't keep watering that thought with your attention, it will not survive more than a day. But what do you do? You keep showering your problems with that attention. When I was a teenager and I had acne problems, I stood in front of the mirror one day and I was popping pimples. And my dad stood and he was watching me. At first, I didn't notice that he was there. And then after a while, he walked past me and he stopped. And he was like, I thought people only paid attention to the things they care about. And he said to me, he says, what you give your attention to, you encourage to stay with you. He says, stop focusing on that pimple. Wash your face and go out. Let me tell you something. Initially, my initial thought was this. This man is here again with all of his philosophies. If I just wash my face, how will the pimple go away? That thing worked like magic. I stopped popping it. I stopped paying attention to it. And it stopped bothering me. And before I knew what was going on, I no longer had to deal with it. Apparently, my problem was not the pimple. My problem was the fact that I thought the pimple had come to end my life. I thought with a face like that, no girl would want to talk to me. But when I allowed the words that the man spoke to me to empower my life, I was amazed at how people would talk to me and they were looking at me, not the acne. And it was like, well, can they not see the acne? Can they not? No? No? And that was because initially I was the one giving roots to it. In fact, I would be the one to call attention to it. I'd be like, oh, excuse the acne. Don't worry about it. I'm, I'm using something for it. Do you know how many times you use your mouth to feed your problems? Because not only do you describe it to God when you're supposed to be describing how big God is to your problem, you also describe it to other people. The same people that you're supposed to witness to of the goodness of God, you spend all the time talking about, girl, if you know what I am going through. You understand what I mean? And because, you know, we like a little sympathy every now and again. We like for somebody to just say, oh, oh my God, really? All of that is going on? No, 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 no. There is no point in being praised for carrying a lot of burden. Because some people want you to know how much stuff they're dealing with so you can say, wow, man, you're brave. No, I don't want to be praised for being brave, carrying too many burdens. I want to be praised for being confident in God to live free and to enjoy the rest. The Bible says, do not forfeit the liberty wherein you have been set free. If you know and you remind yourself how much Jesus paid for your peace, you're, gonna, you're not going to lose that peace over an overdraft of $35. Because Jesus paid with his blood, and yet because somebody sent you a text message that this bill is due for the next 15 minutes, you even forget your name. If someone says, who is that? You will say a debtor. You are not a debtor. You are not a borrower. The Bible says that you will not borrow, but you will lend on to nations. So you need to start to declare yourself as a creditor. You need to start to declare yourself as one who lends to nations. You need to start to declare yourself as one for whom all bills have been paid. You need to declare yourself as one for whom Christ died, who is in Christ Jesus, who has all things. You see, because if we do not do that consciously, problems will keep us out of Jerusalem. Sorrow will keep, on, keep us out of his presence. But that presence is your sanctuary. You need to go there at all costs and by all means. Here is the word of the Lord to you today and we're going to break bread with this verse of scripture. Come with me to the book of Hosea. And we're going to break bread and I thank God for the great and wonderful things that are happening here at Communion House. I know that we did a lot of praying and prophesying on Tuesday. And that means that we are getting ready to have the testimonies come in in droves. In droves. Already, Sister Z shared a testimony with us today of a, of a breakthrough that God has given to their business over there in Nigeria. And I don't even think you've ever been to Nigeria. And God is already giving you so much blessings coming out of there. Praise the Lord. God is good. And I want to prepare your heart for Saturday next week. Somebody say Saturday next week. Against all odds. Our sister Nicole will be here to share her testimonies. When I say testimonies, I want you to know that it is plural. I spoke to her a couple of days ago, and after that phone call, I had to go look in the mirror to see if I've just grown a cape. I felt like 
I felt like I was flying. I'm telling you, that was, I'm like, man, can we have this testimony every morning just to, you know, get me started? Like testimony after testimony of the great things that God is doing in her life. And I'm just so thankful to God. And she said to me, she says, from that moment that the Lord put on your heart to anoint me with oil and you spoke those words, I have been seeing the manifestation. You know, my wife says, when you receive prophecy, don't just expect that things will just happen magically. You need to go to war sometimes. She did go to war sometimes, even on behalf of some other people. She told me somebody called her. She didn't even know who it was, but she went to war on their behalf and said, on, not on my watch would you have to suffer that. And guess what? More testimonies started to abound. I tell you what, I'm not going to ruin it because you, you tell it better this time around. You know, usually I think I tell some people's testimony is better, but I'm not saying it like you said it. So Saturday next week, I'm looking forward to having you come here. So the book of Hosea, chapter 6. In fact, we're going to read chapter 6 another time, but today, um, let's read chapter 4. Hosea is right after the book of Daniel, so in case you're looking for it. Although people are not flipping through Bibles like me, except for Shayla, everybody's using the... Just tell the app where you need to go. Praise God for diamond, everybody. Praise the Lord. Hosea chapter 4 verse 4. We're going to read 4 to 6. 4 and 6. He says, Now let no man contend or rebuke another. For your people are like those who contend with the priest. I'm giving that to you as a bonus. You know, because some people, when I told you, tell yourself the truth. You're like, oh, but if I'm only telling myself the truth, who's going to tell Nicole the truth? You understand what I mean? No, the Bible says, let no man contend or rebuke another. There are times wherein you need to, first of all, rebuke yourself. Okay, so that's just for you to know when God was saying, take heed unto yourself so that you do not bring your burdens on the Sabbath into the gates of Jerusalem. God wants you to deal with yourself first. Let every man bear his burden and, the, and then the burden of others too. So that you don't go on from here and be saying, I've noticed that when worship is on, that lady, she never raises her hand. She must have burdens. I'm going to say to her, woman, drop your burdens. No, no. You praise God and be an example to the believer. Alrighty. So verse 6 is one we're going to break bread with. It says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will reject you from being priest for me because you have forgotten the law of your God I will I also will forget your children the emphasis here is because you forget in the first reading that we did what did the Bible say God says, because they have forgotten me, who is the fountain of life, they will be inscribed into the ground. They'll be reduced to nothing because they have forgotten me. And the Lord is saying here that you can't be a priest if you forget. A priest is supposed to be focused and concentrated on and concentrated and consecrated for the purposes of offering and burning incense to God. And God says, if you do not remember that I have taken away your burdens and you still keep carrying your burdens, there's no way you're going to come here and offer praise. And what we do in my presence is praise. And so if you're struggling with being able to engage the Holy Spirit, struggling with having a quiet time that is full of joy, struggling to having a time of worship in your own home, examine yourselves to see wherein you may have forgotten God. If you remember him as the provider, if you remember him as the healer, if you remember as the, him as the very present help in time of need, then you are qualified to offer praise because no guile will come out of your mouth. Heaven cannot take the risk of letting you in when they know you're coming to complain. You see, and it is important for you 
to be in with God. It is important for you and I to have such a sanctuary in our quiet places with God simply because that is what has always been from the beginning and that is what will always be. These troubles will fade away. These situations will change but your posture as a priest ministering to your heavenly father is eternal. So why don't you embrace the eternal and let the things of time fade away. You can expire your problems when you follow these principles of remembering who your God is. You determine when your situation that is unpleasant expires. You determine that. You make nothing of it. Look at the children of Israel. Whenever they were besieged by an enemy, whenever they were faced with an enemy that they cannot confront on their own, quite often, what does God tell them to do? He tells them to praise. Simply because he knows that by laying down their burdens to pick up praise, they have already reduced that problem to nothing. And if the enemy that is threatening you or that beseeches you, or that, that has come to besiege you, has succeeded in putting a burden of pain, of fear, and sorrow in your heart, that is the hold that they have on you. If you can reduce that hold to nothing, they would have to fall off. And that's why those enemies just fall like ants. They destroy one another. They trample one another into nothing. Simply because what they have plugged into you, you eliminated it. I'm going to say that again very slowly. You see, many of us, the reason why the stronghold of generational curses are still able to drive you away from your destiny is because what those curses do, the symptoms, you have been entertaining those for too long. If the generational curses are a curse of barrenness and that barrenness is making you sorrowful, you keep feeding that curse with sorrow. When it is a generational curse of fruitlessness, for labor and that has now turned you into a person that cannot maintain joy consistently your sorrow is feeding the curse and the curse will remain so when you keep giving attention to that which is unwanted you are the one providing the resource for the unwanted thing to remain because from god's perspective those things do not have a root in themselves so what do you do Remind yourself of who you are. If Jesus died for you indeed, the Bible says whom the son says free, he's free indeed. I don't care how deep that generational curse has been in your family. It doesn't matter how long everyone has had to deal with that in your household. If you align yourself with the promise of God by keeping the most high and his goodness paramount on your heart, those things would have no choice but to dissolve. You can starve your problems to death. Stop feeding your fears. Stop giving in to situations that want to control whether you pray or not. Or how you pray. We need to rise beyond these things because we're not on the same level anymore. Now we're seated in Christ Jesus. We're far above principalities and powers. Let nothing be capable of changing your mood outside of the word of God. I remember once before, I was so protective of certain clients. I'm like, man, I can't lose this client. I can't. If I lose this client, it's over. I can't lose this client. I can't lose this client. And then that will keep me up at night. That will make me do stuff that I ordinarily wouldn't do. And you know what? Some of those clients I lost anyway. And instead of being sad, I realized that maybe I was actually relieved. Because now I don't have to worry no more. And that was when I started to learn that, wait a minute. Anything that makes me fearful cannot be of God. You understand what I mean? And so the Bible says that the blessing of the Lord makes rich and adds no sorrow. And so let me tell you something. I started to operate on the principle. I, I reversed engineer, engineered what happened to me. Because when I lost some of those clients, I felt free because now I'm like, oh my God, 
Now they're gone. I may not know where the next check is coming from, but I am free. And my peace is more important than the peace that they were given to me. So guess what I started to do? The moment I recognized, you know, there are certain situations that are challenging to bring out the best in you, to bring out your creative juice. It helps you to go a step further, to go a step higher. There are such situations, but you will know because you'll be joyful about picking up the challenge and excelling at it. But when it becomes something that is just draining you and sucking your life dry, before they drop you, drop them. Oh, yes. Before they drop you, drop them. I remember after I had learned that lesson, there was a gentleman in Atlanta that wanted to make my life miserable because he would bring a lot of jobs and he wanted to call the shots. One day he called me and I said to him, I said, I don't even want to do your work. He was like, you don't understand. I said, understand what exactly? He said, this is a big opportunity. I said, big to you. I said, but to me, it's nothing. He was like, man, I'm sorry for calling you. It's a waste of time. He hung up the phone. He called the client. They told him that if he doesn't put me back on the project, that they're not going to give it to him. And so he called me, was like, um, I don't know how to say this, but we really need you to be on the project. I said, why is that? He said, because the client says you have to be on the project. I said, but didn't you tell them? I said, I was not interested. He said, but please, we all need it. I said, okay, it's going to be on my terms. I am not going to Alabama. I'm going to be in Atlanta. I can join phone calls, but I'm not going to Alabama. It was like, as you say, I had peace. He was going to bully me because you know some people have witchcraft. The spirit of manipulation. They want to manipulate you. But they can only manipulate you if you don't know who you are. I am a child of the most high God. <laughs> and then some uncircumcised Philistine. You know because sometimes in order for you to fully be reminded of your place, you need to call out other people's places. David did not say, oh, I am a good shepherd, like my heavenly father. No, he looked at Goliath and he was like, wait a minute, this uncircumcised Philistine, how dare you insult the armies of the most high God? You know, some people make you feel like because they hold some kind of power over you, because they're the ones cutting that check every two weeks, they can talk to you anyhow. Let me tell you something. God's been wanting to promote you for so long, but you're holding on to change. And God is like, as long as you're holding on to the change that the man is giving to you, you will not receive the change that I am bringing. So you need to learn how to put people in their places because Jesus paid too much for that joy. And many of us have become accustomed to going to work where we're sat for eight hours. It's like, I'm doing it for the duty. No, 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 no. It is not worth the eternal treasure that God has given to you. And let me tell you something. Sometimes when you say that is when they know your worth and they start dancing to your tune. I'm saying this for the benefit of some of us in here that God wants to promote but you keep elevating some men and women over God in your life. You know what the Bible says? The fear of man brings only a sneer. I believe it was David who said, I am not afraid. What can man do unto me? We need to break away from such fears. And how do you break away? It's right here. You need to remember the Lord your God. Remember who he is and who you are. You are made in his image and in his likeness. Let nothing, likeness, let nothing take you for a ride. I know that this is a very sensitive area, but I've got the leading in my heart to touch on it. The area of health. You know, some of us, we have infirmities in our bodies. We have pain that just weighs us down. Because you feel the pain in your body, it feels more real than whatever it is that God has for you in heaven. Because this one, you're feeling it in your body. How many people can relate with that? Because sometimes it's like, man, I really want to go to church today, but I, my back is hurting so bad. Let me tell you something, folks. Ask yourself this question. Is the word of God true or not? If the word of God true, if the word of God is true, brother Ron, where are you right now? It's a trick question because your wife is sitting next to you and you wouldn't want to say anything too fancy. But the reality of it is you are seated in Christ Jesus. 
at the right hand of the Father. But the reason why you are not as conscious of what is going on around his throne right now is because you have a need in the natural to be conscious of your immediate space so that when you're walking, you don't stumble, so that when your wife holds your hand, she can get your attention when she's talking to you, you can repeat what she was saying because of the pressing need of the natural. That is the reason why our consciousness is so focused on the natural. But when you realize that you are a spirit being who needs to be as conscious of heaven as you are of the earth, some of these pains that appear to be so pressing will no longer be as pressing. The reason why we feel it more than we feel the liberty that he has given to us is because that is where our focus is. You know what Paul said? He says, I have struggled with this infirmity in my body. He says, for, for three, on three occasions, I have sought the Lord to take this infirmity away from me. He said, but the Lord hasn't done anything about it. He says, it has now become a messenger of Satan that buffets me. And while he was still sitting there feeling sorry for himself, he just remembered who he was. He says, I put my body under. He said, because I haven't led others to Christ, God forbid that I myself become a castaway. He says, this body, I am going to put it under. I'm not going to let it be above me. Even though there was still infirmity in that body, he put the body in its place. Let me tell you something. Your body should not be the one controlling you. It is your spirit that should control this body as an asset and a tool. Walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We need to train ourselves to be more conscious of who we are in the spirit than who we are in the flesh because what you focus on is what you magnify. So when you focus too much on your flesh and on earthly things, a little headache can take you out completely for hours. Just a little headache and you will start saying things that you shouldn't say. Some people have a headache and they're like, man, this headache is killing you. And I'm like, wow, the power of life and death are in the tongue. If you say it's killing you, then it's killing you. So what do you say? You tell yourself, I know that I have this feeling in my head, but it is alien to my life experience because I've already been set free. This is a symptom announcing an infirmity, but the, the Bible would not say that by his stripes, I was healed, so I'm already healed. So whatever this thing is, I call you nothing. You speak life, and before you know what's going on, those things will recognize who you are, and they will bother you no more. Even when they rear their ugly heads, they will not last because they have no root in themselves. If you do not remember anything, praise the Lord. From all of what I have said today, I want you to remember this. Whatever it is that is standing in your face that seems to be oppressing your life and existence, it has no root in itself except for the one that you give to it. Stop paying attention to it. Stop confessing to what is longevity. Speak life and death will go away. Remember the fountain of life and you will rise to your sanctuary. Let us stop focusing on the things that we should reduce used to nothing. So as we break bread today, and finally, I'm going to close this Bible. Actually, verse 7. The Bible says, the more they increased, the more they sinned against me. I would change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people. They set their hearts on their iniquity. You see, the Lord's put this on my heart for so long now and I've been looking, I've been not looking for ways, but I've been intentional about letting the Holy Spirit guide me how I break it down. You know, I've been speaking lately about righteousness that does not come from works, but righteousness that is a privilege. This is one of the things that the Lord said to me. As we break bread today, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. So we have read in verse 6, that we need to remember the Lord. We need to remember him. When we break bread, we're doing this in remembrance of him. We remember that he's the provider. He's the healer. He's the lover of our soul. He cares about us. He never leaves us nor, nor forsakes us. He has made us in his image and in his likeness. We remember all those things. That is correct. 
But it says, as they started to multiply, so did their sin multiply. So as we continue to have days multiplied to us and activities multiplied to us, we begin to naturally get distanced from God. So it is okay for you to wake up in the morning feeling vibrant and by 2 p.m. you're sounding like the unbeliever in your office because as time progresses, you are naturally being distanced from the consciousness of God that you have. So we all need to remind ourselves constantly of who we are. And one of the ways by which your ability to remember who God is and who you are in him, one of the things that gets in the way is the consciousness of your own weakness and iniquity. And the Bible says, my people focused on their iniquity and that was to their detriment. So what do you do? You remind yourself that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Let me give you this example and then we're going to break bread. You see sometimes in the morning you wake up and you feel like you're ready to take on the day. And then you get to work, they send you that nasty email. And then you get that phone call. And little by little, you're getting further away from the one that felt like the champion in the morning. And guess what that does to you? Even though at 2 p.m. you want to remind yourself that you are the head and not the tail, you remember that in one of those emails, they called you out for not having done that presentation correctly. They tell you that, oh, if you had not come late for that meeting, things would not have gone that way. So people and things remind you of your iniquity. And that is the reason why you fail to be reminded of your integrity you fail to remember your identity in Christ Jesus because you have been reminded of your shortcomings you have a headache and you're like yeah because I didn't drink enough water you have stomach problem oh that's because I'm eating too much you keep focusing on what you do as opposed to what he has done and he says remembering and thinking of their iniquity is what keeps bringing them down so you cannot do those two things at the same time you can't remember God while you're remembering your iniquity so you need to focus on the fact that he has already made you perfect in Christ Jesus you are a just man made perfect and once you've taken care of the issue of your own identity and righteousness in Christ Jesus guess what follows once you have attained that righteousness by faith, peace, and joy. So as we break bread today, I want you to tap in to that which has been said. And say to yourself prayerfully in, in humility before God. That I will no longer focus on what I can do or what I have done. As much as I will focus on what Jesus can do and what he has done. And by so doing, I will remember the goodness of the Lord and not the failure of the man. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, as we come before you today to partake of the Lord's body and to drink of his blood in remembrance of him, let our consciousness be open to embrace the knowledge of your goodness and to embrace the knowledge of who we are in Christ Jesus, that we may be able to say no to thoughts that bring us down, that we may be able to stop feeding the troubles that we are supposed to be eliminating. Father, in Jesus' name, your words come forth today to set us free, to help us prepare to receive what you are bringing. Let us not fail in trusting. Let us not fail when it comes to trusting in you completely because you care for us. I want you to just put your hand on your chest and let's just have a moment of deliverance here real quick. I don't want you to say any word in prayer, but just listen. And as it makes sense to you, as you find that your heart is connecting with what I am saying, I want you to agree with an amen. But just put your hand on your chest. I want to pray for you. And I'm going to tell you very quickly what that prayer is about. There are needles that have been left in some of us. I want you to open your eyes actually for a moment and look at me because I want you to get this, this picture. There are needles, 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 needles in some of us that have been left there by the enemy, which makes it easy for Satan and his messengers to keep injecting us with poison. They have left those needles taped to our heart. And so when they come, they just come with a little syringe to introduce more poison. And as you put your hand on your chest today, I want you to know that the Lord 
by the ministry of his angels, is removing needles from hearts today. The Lord is removing needles from hearts today, making it difficult for you to be afflicted by Satan and by the same evil that has plagued you. When they come, they will no longer find access to your heart. When they come, they will no longer, you see the same words that they would say that will hurt you and trigger trauma will no longer mean anything to you because it's no longer connecting to your heart. And so now let us bow our heads. This much you will say, Lord, I am ready to be fully delivered. Now I'm going to pray for you. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you for the release of your ministering spirits over your people in here today. Every heart that is being presented to you today by faith, let your angels deliver from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. So right now in the mighty name of Jesus, receive your deliverance. You have been delivered from the injections of the enemy, from the traumas of the past, from the poison of lies, from the poison of shame, from the poison of condemnation. And I also declare you delivered from seasonal troubles. Those things that happen to you every first quarter of the year or second quarter of the year. Those things that happen to you when it's about to be Memorial Day, when it's about to be Labor Day, you already know those things around Thanksgiving. It just has to happen. And that's because there is a connection that has been made by the enemy and they keep coming in every season to feed you with more poison that weighs you down. You have been delivered today to live the abundant life, even the more than abundant life that Jesus promised. I want you to make a note of today because indeed the Lord has delivered you. You are not going back to where you were and you are not going back to the same level that the Lord has picked you from. From here, your path is shining brighter and brighter in the name of Jesus. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Mambros kita la delevas tile murumus kita la darigeta bosa. I want to pray for anybody who is interested in the interpretation of dreams. Just stand up wherever you are, where you, wherever you are, very quickly. If you have desired the ability to interpret even your own dreams, stand up wherever you're at. Father, we thank you. He will not quarrel nor cry out. Matthew chapter 12, verse 19. He will not quarrel, nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. He will not quarrel, nor cry out, nor shall anyone hear his voice in the streets. But you will hear his voice. Because you know his voice. All the, all the messages that have been inseminated in the dreams that you've been having that you have not picked up on have been messages that came to you in the voice of the Good Shepherd. Now begin to hear his voice. Begin to see his signal. Begin to see and understand the motion of his hand. The hand of the Lord is being unveiled to you from this moment onwards. What he is saying to you as a mystery, you will understand it because it is the glory of God to conceal a matter and it is the glory of kings to search it out. I pray for you today, every single person that is tapping into this grace from this moment onwards, you will hear and immediately know what the Lord is saying. I want to pray for somebody today. I see that the Lord is instructing you to take down a particular flag and raise another one. You see, your allegiance to the world needs to be dethroned. 
And you need to raise the flag of the kingdom. So take down the flag of the world. Let your heart learn how to examine every thought, every pursuit. There are ambitions within you that you have sugar-coated with Christianity. There are ambitions that you may have sugar-coated with wanting to help humanity. Whereas in reality, it's because the world teaches you to excel in that area. And so you also want to excel because it means something in the world. And you've convinced yourself, oh, I'm doing it for the Lord. Maybe when I do this, I'll be able to help more people. The Lord is saying, bring down the flag of the world. And raise the banner of righteousness. Examine my heart. Search me and know me. That was what David said. I bestow upon you today by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the search light of heaven to search your heart, to reveal whatever flags of the world you are still raising and flying high. Let not the world remain in you. The Bible says Satan, the prince of this world, came to Jesus and found nothing in him. Dethrone every ambition and every quest that is of the world. Dethrone it now in the mighty name of Jesus. And in place of it, raise the banner of righteousness. Raise the banner of the kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And every other thing shall be added unto you. Praise the Lord. Now, this is it. I'm going to tell you this very quickly and then we're going to, we're going to take the offering and leave. So, I know some of you, you are shielded against the news. Your heart is shielded against what's coming out of the news. But your heart is not shielded against certain people. So, even though you don't hear it directly, when you hear it from them, you consider it. You consider the merits of it. Today I pray for you that the Lord would allow for you to immediately identify the messengers of the false prophet in your life. You know that I told you that there was some news update coming that will come out of the news that will immediately become fear in the hearts of many people. Many of you are not even watching the news to know or to hear it. And many of you, when you hear it, you're like, oh, it's coming from the news, I'm not going to hear it. But Satan has already raised stooges. He has croonings and pawns that are going around spreading this thing. And when you hear it from this particular person, you're like, oh my God, maybe I need to pay attention. No, you don't. So the Lord will reveal you to them. When you see them, the Lord will let you know that their tongue has been sold to the deceiver. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, that you will not recognize any authority of anyone in the world above the authority of Christ. That in the mighty name of Jesus, nobody that you have given authority to will be able to use it against you because you're taking that honor and you're giving it only to God. You will not believe them because they are not of God and the Lord will let you know. Romans chapter 3 verse 4 says, let God be true and every man a liar. I pray for you today that you will not fall for the onslaught of Satan that is forthcoming. You will not give in to the, to, to, to the advances of the false prophet. Regardless of who comes that says to you there's a casting down, you have already heard that there is a lifting up and nothing will change your confidence in God. And lastly, I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, I want you to look at your hand. Look at your hand and say that these hands are ready to hold on to Jesus alone. I let go of anything that will pull me away from Jesus. I hold on to him alone because in him is all things that I need. Everything that I need is in Jesus. I'm ready to let go of everything else but him in the mighty name of Jesus. We're going to continue on Tuesday by the grace of God, but I just knew that I needed to give you those ones very quickly. And then the last one is this. If you have children in here who live in your house, lay your hands on them often. Let me say this. This is the word the Lord revealed to me. The world has access to your children through screens through other people. 
but you still have the advantage of having that proximity in order to lay hands on them physically. Use it. Use that thing to undo hours of the wrong programming. One hand laying can undo an entire TV show that has polluted the mind of your child. This is not psychology. This is not therapy. This is mystery revealed by the Holy Spirit. And it has a basis in the word of God. The Bible says by the laying on of hands of the presbytery or the eldership, the gifts of God are being stirred up. Use what you have. Lay hands on them. When they're running in front of you, just tap them. When they want you to open a bottle for them, bring them close. Touch them. Use that which you have. You see, when the Lord says that you're ready to disciple, it's because the power will flow, but you need to put a load on the power. Let your children become a load that you're putting on so that the power feeds them as well. I'm using the word load in as far as electricity is concerned, not a burden. Okay, so when you put a little bulb into a socket, it becomes a load on that socket. Let those children have access to what is on the ready on the inside of you. The Lord says, I need to give you one more. So I'm happy to give you one more. See, Revelation chapter 7 verse 1. Revelation 7 1, and we're going to let you be out of here. In a moment, Revelation 7, 1, the Bible says, After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and the wind should not blow, and that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. You know, I've taught about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I've taught about the four living creatures. I've taught about these four angels that are holding the wind of destruction. I've spoken about that a lot, and all of what I've been sharing with you has been mostly pre preparation, is to prepare us. And I told you once before that we were in the season of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. In 2020, we saw the, the one that had the crown. We saw the corona, which means crown. We saw that in 2020, and we saw the conflict, we saw the division, we saw all of that. But there is an assembly now of the four together. And I'm not talking about them operating in phases, wherein one comes, the other goes, and another comes, and the other goes. I'm talking about the magnitude of the four is the season that we're coming into. And so what does that mean to you as a person? What it means to you as a person is that you need to check to see that the seal of the Lord is on the doorpost of your house. Okay, okay, let's just, let's, let's read one more verse because I want you to get this, right? The Bible says in verse three, let's even read verse two. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out, he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea saying, do not harm the earth. Let me bring out something for out very quickly because I used to miss this until the Holy Spirit showed it to me. What were the angels that are holding the wind of destruction? What were they given power to harm? They were given power to harm the earth, the sea, or any tree. Take note of that. But when this angel of the Lord came to them, what did he say? He says to them, he was crying out to the angels who have been granted the power to harm the earth and the sea. He didn't mention the tree. Even though the angels have been given power to harm the tree. You see, the earth is one thing. The sea is one thing. The earth is what was under the sea when God created the heavens and the earth. But we came out of that mix and he called us something different. He says, you are trees. You are like green olive trees in the house. So don't let us be mistaken. They have the power to harm the tree unless the tree has something else that will prevent him from being harmed. So don't just assume that, oh, I'm a believer. I'm good to go. Let me tell you something, we are no longer in that season of just taking chances. These boys have the power to harm just about anybody, including the trees. Now look at what it says. 
In verse 3, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads. Because anybody that does not have the seal on their foreheads. Remember what happened at Exodus when the angel of the Lord called the angel of death. When he came, the Lord says, this angel, he doesn't look at faces. He only recognizes the blood. If the blood is not on your doorpost, it's over. The same angel of the Lord that was sent is now saying, hold off guys, hold off, hold off, hold off. Do not release all your vengeance until we have sealed the saints of the Almighty God. And what is that seal? The Bible says we have a seal until the day of his coming, even the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is your seal until the day of redemption. Someone to encourage you, engage the Holy Spirit always. Be filled with the Holy Spirit always. Pray in tongues often. Make sure, because in Exodus, they were told to make sure that the seal of the blood has not run off their doorpost, that is still there. So what do you do? Make sure that you have not allowed yourself to grieve the Holy Spirit. Make sure that you're not feeling too confident in self and leaning on your own understanding. These are not the seasons to be carnal. These are the seasons. We are in the season of being in the Holy Spirit all the time. Let me tell you something, even if you find yourself having thoughts that wander, even if you have yourself having things in your flesh that you have not been able to overcome, always ensure that you go to the Holy Spirit in all humility and ask for help and say, help me. Because when you engage him for help, that counts. When you engage him for comfort, that counts. When you engage him for lessons because he's the teacher, that counts. But you need to do those things in the season that we're in. And now you have no excuse for the Lord has delivered you from the needles of the enemy. And he has also given you a new heart. And he has said to you, remember me and forget your iniquity. And the Lord also has said to you that in the time and in the seasons that we are in, he is your seal by the ministry of his Holy Spirit so that you are not consumed. I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, let us maintain the seal that can maintain our salvation in the mighty name of Jesus. I'm just going to pray for one more category of people and I'm going to go to my seat. You know, when Paul had the snake go on his hand, what did he do? He shook it off. He didn't tell the snake to move. He shook it off, right? There are people here that have been speaking to certain situations and there's no change. Some situations, you don't speak to them, you shake them off. The wisdom to know the difference is in the house tonight. And so if you have situations that you have spoken to that appear to be immovable, you have spoken to those situations, you have prayed, you have cried out to God, but nothing seems to be happening. What you need is the wisdom to shake them off. So very quickly, I want you to just tap into that wisdom because it is here. If I were you, I would raise my hand wherever I'm at. If that is something that I am interested in, if I know that that word is for me, I am tapping into it right now and saying, Lord, I receive the wisdom to know the difference between the things that I speak to and the things that I shake off. Lord, by your wisdom, I will shake off the beast into the fire. By your wisdom, I will let go of the things that have held onto me. I will shake them off and I will be free in the mighty name of Jesus. Someone, I heard someone in their heart saying, Father, thank you for that. I needed that. Who is that? I want you to come forward. I want to actually lay my hands on you. You see, I heard that saying, I needed that. I needed that. You see, there are certain feelings that we have that have to be shaken off. Do you know that depression has to be shaken off? You have to shake it off. And it takes the wisdom of God to shake it off. It may be unconventional what he asks you to do, but you will know it is him. And when, you see, because he's unconventional, 
to disturb a snake that is fasting to your hand. If anything at all, people tell you to stand still and not move. But Paul did the unconventional. And he shook it into the fire. You already know what you must do in your heart. And whatever may be hidden from you still, let the veil be lifted. You have come in here today and received the wisdom of God for deliverance, for peace. In the mighty name of Jesus, every tent that the enemy has cast over you to shield you from the light of God's revelation, I drop them right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Let the heavens that are above you be open to you that you may see the handwriting of your father, that you may see the rainbow that is above your head, the reminder of his promises not to destroy you but to promote you, to keep you. In the mighty name of Jesus, I speak to you. Now hear me and hear me deep within. The Lord is with you. He is closer to you than the oppressor is or can ever be. So open your eyes and experience his embrace. In the mighty name of Jesus, you are shaking off the beast. Not next week, not next month. But this week, you are shaking off the beast. You understand what I mean? In the mighty name of Jesus, praise the Lord. God bless you. I want you to just do this wherever you are. If you're standing here, just shake, shake it off. Shake it off, shake it off, shake it off, shake it off. In the mighty name of Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah. All right, let me pray for you because I, um, I know that there is a need. So you, why don't you come in here? And so Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, let it be to this woman according to her faith. Lord, I ask for her journey to be honored by the miracle that she seeks. And let there be a dispatch of angels to reconnect the loop for the change that I am asking for so that she receives her miracle without any trade-off. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, because freely has she received this of you. In the mighty name of Jesus, I declare you whole. Every tree that is in you that my heavenly Father has not planted, I dissolve away by the grace that is in the name of of the righteous one. Wave your hands and praise the Lord because you have been heard, you have been seen, and now you will see. In the mighty name of Jesus, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I want to pray for you, Sister Barbara. I need, I, need to, I need you to come here real quick. I need you to come here real quick. I pray for you in the mighty name of Jesus and the spirit of discouragement. Any wind of discouragement that the enemy is trying to blow your way, that shooting them as arrows, none of them will touch you. In the mighty name of Jesus, let there be that shield around you that is promised to you by your heavenly Father. He is your shield and your buckler. But there is a specific shield assigned to you in this season. You will not be discouraged. You will pray as you should. You will rejoice as you should and you will be confident to declare the truth as you should. No discouragement will be your portion in this season in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray for this woman also. I'm praying for you right now in the name of Jesus. They haven't seen you and they will not see you until the Lord is ready to reveal you. So in confidence, Make your preparation because no one sees you. You see, let me tell you something. The Lord has hidden you to prepare you. But when the time comes, only he can make you seen. So for now, let him adorn you because that is what he's doing in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Sister Z, you have to shake off the beast Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, the Lord will reveal to you how the beast came in the first place. Not what you think. And the moment he reveals to you, that revelation holds your liberation. It is not what you think, says the Lord, but he will reveal to you what it really is, how it came, that you may learn thereby the ways of heaven. In the mighty name of Jesus, it is your season. 
to see in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Let us come closer here. Praise the Lord. Brother Brad, you're next in line. So I know you came out here because you are eager to receive the fullness of what has been promised. That's why you're standing here. But that word that you got on Tuesday is still working. You see what I mean? Remember those thoughts that have been eliminated from your heart. I see them again as you're standing in here. The Lord says he's removing every one of those thoughts that have plagued you, every one of those mindsets, every one of those connections to opposing forces, to emotions that are not progressive in your life. You see, when I was praying for needles to be removed, needles have been removed from you. And so, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, I just pray that by faith and patience, this man will receive the fullness of that which has been promised in the mighty name of Jesus. And, Lord, I thank you because the work that has begun is a good work. And it was started by you. And so we're confident that it will, it will be brought to a perfect completion in the mighty name of Jesus. Don't be too focused on a temporary relief, okay? If you, if you want a temporary relief and you have that agitation within you, just tell yourself, no, I am here to receive not just a temporary relief, but the fullness of what my Heavenly Father has. Let that be your resolution. Be resolute. Tell yourself, nothing temporal. No, thank you. I am here to receive the fullness of what my Heavenly Father has. You have come a long way, too long a way, to be sold on something that is inferior. Brother Ron, I want you to say to yourself, I block my ear to the voice of deception. I want you, is this ear that I am seeing? This one, this one right here. Yeah, block your ear to the voice of deception. Anyone that wants to mislead you, you will not hear their voice. You see, what I see is a male wearing uniform. You will not hear their voice. You know, they will come to you as though they are on your side, but in reality, someone is pulling their strings. You will not hear what they have to say. They ha the Lord scrambles their voice to you from this moment onwards in the mighty name of Jesus. Anyone that is looking to set you up so that they can set you back, you will not hear their voice. They don't, see, this person doesn't mean well, but they look well. They look like somebody that, you know, is dressed as you were dressed. But the Lord says that whoever is pulling their string is pulling them against you and you will not hear their voice. In the mighty name of Jesus, your heart is secure in the love of your heavenly father and by wisdom you will recognize the victory that the Lord has given to you that you may give glory to God in the mighty name of Jesus. What I hear is that you will give glory to God in your heart and you will seize that as an opportunity to let another know of the goodness of God. But you will not be deceived, you will not be confused, neither will anyone take advantage of you by suggestions that are not of God in the mighty name of Jesus. However subtle it may sound, the Lord will let you know. The Lord has already exposed them to you, your spirit already knows. So when they come, you will just know that their voice is not for your heart. The wisdom of God is all the guide that you need. Let them keep those suggestions. For now, you are running with the counsel that is coming from within in Jesus' name. God bless you. Alrighty, Papa. Anybody else that is standing here to be prayed for? Please, let's just come close. Uh, for the sake of Nicole, she's been here since 6 o'clock. She needs to go home. Thereabouts. Father, in Jesus' name. Rabakum deledari alaba. Sif lukum. Shtalaimende kas kum shib lukum. Sif fri endemia. Let there be more hands assigned to this man to expedite that which he has already received of the Lord. So I know that you have allowed your heart to grow in patience before the Lord in waiting for the fulfillment of promise. The Lord has seen you. I see you and I ask for you today. I ask concerning you today and on your behalf as an intercessor that more hands be assigned to you by heaven in righteousness to speed up the delivery. You have already begun to see the flow. And now the Lord is saying the abundance is being delivered even more speedily. The restoration is happen happening even more speedily in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you because you have granted unto me this privilege to be able to ask of the ministry of your angels concerning my brother that he may receive the help that is most needed in the mighty name of Jesus. Do not close your eyes to the one that comes to help. Do not close your eyes to the one that comes to help. They will come 
Keep your eyes open. The one that has come to help, you must see them, that you may receive of them in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Anybody else? Are you standing to be praying for or you're helping? Okay, I'll pray for you. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, as soon as I put my hand on your shoulder, I remember the word that the Lord gave to you maybe a couple of meetings ago, two or three meetings ago. Don't hold on to anything with an affection that belongs to the Lord. Let your affection be for the Lord and your confidence be for the Lord totally. Don't hold on to anything. Nothing, and in particular, let me say this. In particular, when it comes to how much confidence you put in things, if you think something is going to save you, if you think someone is going to save you, they're going to you know, be the, the, the magic pill that just solves the problem. The Lord is saying that's too much confidence to put in anything. Let your confidence be completely in God so that when he tells you to let go, you will just let go. Remember, you were one of those people specifically that that word was for, that these hands will not hold on to things, but will hold on only to only the Lord. You see, because if we put our confidence, the confidence that is meant to be for God, if we put it in a job, in an investment, or in any community that God has not led us to, we are setting ourselves up for a disappointment. Yes, you've done your research. Yes, you've made your observation. But the Lord is saying, participate, but let your trust be in me completely. And the moment any participation or involvement is beginning to erode your trust in God, to put your trust in things, call yourself back to order. Like the word of God says, take heed unto yourself that you do not give place to the devil. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because this man's confidence in you will continue to grow and his confidence in you will take deep root within him so that when the storm comes, he will not panic. Neither will he worry and say, do you not care that I perish? But he will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in you will I put my trust. In the mighty name of Jesus, the Lord is changing your heart. The Lord is renewing your mind. You're a new man in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's just give God praise. Let's thank him for his faithfulness. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So this is what I'm going to do real quick, just for the benefit of time. And because the Lord has instructed me to continue to say a word of blessing concerning the ones who have said we are making it a point of obedience to respond to the call to partner with what God is doing in the house. Remember, I think it was Saturday last week, was it not, that I told you that I was breaking tradition? Because typically I wouldn't raise an offering. But I am breaking tradition because the Lord is saying, do it for the sake of what I want to do. The Lord is asking to see faithfulness in mammon. So that when that which is not mammon, that which is not material, comes, you will be confident enough to be a partaker of it. And so if you are one of those people, you've heard it, but you haven't done anything about it, I want to encourage you. The work of the Lord has continued up until now because of divine providence. If the Lord is asking you, to give, to make, an, to make a commitment, to give something sacrificial. He's doing it because of you, because he wants to open up your heart. The Bible says, he that is unfaithful and unrighteous mammon, who will give to them the true riches of the kingdom? When Nicole started to share her testimony with me, one of the things that she said is this. She said, Pastor, I wish people knew the power of opening up in generosity to the work that God is doing. Because she's a living witness to what happens when we obey, when the Lord says to give, when the Lord says to plug in materially to what he is doing. Because the money that was given could not have achieved all of what she has received because she knows it's the favor of God that is speaking. You want to engage that which the Lord is speaking over this house in the coming season, do as the Lord is asking in this season. You see what I mean? By the grace of God, our needs are met. But the Lord is saying, you need to plug in. And so I'm going to pray for those, for those people who have decided to plug in. But I'm also praying for your heart to open. For you to say, you know what? I am not just going to be an observer of what the Lord is doing here. But I am going to be a partner with God in this house for what God is doing in this prophetic ministry. So I'll give you a moment. If you are yet to plug in and now you're hearing in your heart that it is time I'm going to give you a moment to respond with an action, not just with a deliberation. As we were coming in here today, the Lord said to me, we need to show our passion by our action. So if you're passionate about what God is doing and you're eager to see 
let your action be that of obedience in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for those of us who have responded. And I thank you for those of us who are responding right now. This is an act of faith. It is an act of obedience. It is an act of trust because we know when you gave a command and we obey, we will eat the good of the land. So Lord, we're not giving just to receive. We're giving in obedience and we're giving as a form of worship as you have commanded. And Lord, we thank you for this house and how supernaturally you have met our needs consistently by your faithfulness. We do not take it for granted. And for the, part, for the ones who are being raised to partner with you and with us in this work of the ministry, they will not lose their reward. And Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because as we go forth from here today, the light of your glory will be seen upon us. Gentiles will come to our light and kings to the brightness of our shining. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. So that is it for today. But I want to remind you, continue to prepare your heart. There is a Wednesday meeting that is coming. Amen. You know how I was reminded of it a couple of days ago? I was at home minding my business. And suddenly I saw that Wednesday meeting again. And first when I saw it, I was like, what meeting is this? And it was told to me, it is that Wednesday meeting. So just continue to tell yourself, Father, whenever that Wednesday meeting is, whenever it comes, it will be memorable for me in glory and in praise. You see, because the Lord's given us a long notice and it's not going to be much longer, I can assure you that. I see it, it is very close. And until then, let's keep coming on Tuesdays and Saturdays and joining the online prayer meeting on on. Wednesdays. Now we have the Zoom link for those people that are allergic to Instagram. You can contact Alan. He's going to connect you with the Zoom link so that you can join that as well. And I want to encourage you, if you have not been studying the Word of God, when my wife came up today, she was speaking under the unction of the Holy Spirit very expressly because some of us, we need to have our blindness cured. There are certain things that God is doing around you and within you that you are blind to. So what do you do? Get in the word and you will see it. God bless you. I'll see you Tuesday.